when we go through this here, there will be a lot of things that uh, William Miller reminds me of me because uh, things that goes on, you're trying to figure things out in your mind. Sometimes, when I, when I started studying in 1980, in 1982, that's the day I fell in love with Jesus Christ. We have been Advent as clear back to the 1860s. I have talked about that before here. In fact, Randy Brims and I are distant cousins. It's kind of unique. There's three men that have really made a difference in my life. One of them was my father. One of them was Ron Wyatt that I met. And the other one is John. It's right here. I was started to study the Vatican, how the Vatican controls us. And on my computer at home, I have a 56-inch monitor, and it's rather large. I wanted a smaller room, but my son influenced me to have it. And I came across this uh, article from the 1840s, for, in 1844, the midnight, the Western Midnight Cry. And I says, I want to see if I can get, and I started reading these articles to see how close I can get to October 22, 1844. Well, I came to one, and if you look at the paper that's hand out, I'm going to read a couple paragraphs. This is from Cincinnati, Saturday, June 29, 1844. It's a few months before October. And this is by J.V. Hines, which uh, he mentioned earlier. And it's The Watchman, What of the Night? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read, if you can see the, where this is yellow, it's about the second and third paragraph. The sum and substance of his confession was to this effect, that the time in which he had expated the end had passed, and he had no other definite point of time in view, that he was now continuing to look for it, and he was satisfied it was near, and that it should not cease to look for it while he lived. Should it be his lot to die, be the time no longer or shorter. By the way, this is the confession of William Miller. And when I first saw this confession before 18, uh, Oct before October 22, reading on, the Baptist Register of June 12 gives currency to the reported confession as follow. Mr. Miller's confession. We learned that from the Christian Herald that Mr. Miller preached at the Tabernacle Boston on 28th and made what he called his confession. He stated that what he had preached and published respecting the coming of the Lord in 43 was done honestly and that he fully believed it. But now that that time had come and transpired, he was yet to be proven to be mistaken. That when he, the time passed, he had, let's see, the time passed, he felt bad, felt lonely, thought he should never have anything more to say in public, and felt more on the account of others than he did himself. He said there was an error somewhere in the calculation, but he could not tell where. He now had no definite time. He should wait God's time. It might come in a day. It might come in 50 years. He could not say exactly when. He was waiting. This is Magnum, whatever, yeah, and Christian. So far as the controversy with Mr. Miller is concerning, respecting 43, it is enough. And then there's more of that article. But clear, if you look down the, the bottom three lines, he confessed that he had been disappointed, but by no means discouraged or shaken in his faith in God's goodness or in the entire fulfillment of his world, word, or in the speedy coming of our Savior. So now we're going to look at who was William Miller and what is some of the things that he went through. I learned a lot studying this thing, the misconceptions that I have. Now, I also believe, for you that haven't heard me speak before, that uh, the 2300 days, there's going to be another application in the 1260, 1290, 1335s, and Daniel 12, there's going to be a, another application. I have spoken here numerous times on it. There is so much of it we do not know. 
So the first, uh, most of this here is, comes from a bibliography about William Miller. I know of two of them, and this is, comes from one of them. Before I gave this before, I sent it out to the people on my email list. For the vision is for an appointed time. Boy, aren't they all? Where is the Seventh-day Adventist? For the vision is for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Now, let's go and see about William Miller. He was born in Pittsburgh, Massachusetts, February 15, 1782. His family moved to Low Hampton, New York, when he was very young. So you can see that God raised a new nation, and about the same time, he raised a young man to start this new message. They started approximately the same time. Now, this is a picture of William Miller. Now, the reason I put this up there, I'm an emergency room nurse. I have lived my whole life, it seems like, in the emergency room. Before I went to the prison, it was a Hanford community, and I was a charge nurse there. And I spent a lot of time trying to decipher doctor's handwriting. If you look at him, William Miller did not take that class of handwriting. Well, maybe he did to learn how not to, so people couldn't read it. I'm just trying to show you who William Miller is. <coughs> Now, this bibliography is called The Midnight Cry by Francis D. Nichol. First printing was in December of 1844. A defense of the character and conduct of William Miller and the Millerites who mistakenly believed that the second coming of Christ would take place in the year 1844. And most of these, the rest of it, will be from that book. William grew up in a home that was blessed with poverty. Even candles was needed and was used in very sparing way. William had an unquenchable desire for knowledge. He collected a store of pine knots. Now, I don't know what that is. And bright so you could read. For illumination. When all the family was asleep, he would silently make his way to the fireside, stir the embers, light the pine knot, and begin his reading. One night, his father, awakened from slumber and seeing the cabin aglow, thought it was on fire, and he lost sight for his son's ambition and chased Bill to bed, saying, If you not go to bed, I'll his, uh, horse whip you. Now, the reason I put this in, you can see William Miller at a young age, and you can see, start seeing some of the way he was developed. He kept a diary, and on July 10, it didn't say which year, he started out with, with the history of my life. I was clearly educated and taught to pray the Lord. The next day it said, Sunday, grandfather preached at our house from Psalms 23, fourth verse, and from Colossians 3, first verse. So you can see from a very young age, he was being taught these things. It's not that way today. It needs to be this way today. Now there's another uh, bibliography. It, I didn't think it was as well done. Sylvester Bliss, biography of William in 1853, calls him a scriber general. He wrote a manuscript which opens thus, Mr. Chairman and gentlemen, though I feel myself inadequate to the task, Yet I will endeavor to surmount all difficulties and give the society a short dissertation on, yeah, one of those words I always have problems with. William Miller was a farmer. Though the manuscript is undated, internal evidence reveals that it was prepared during the presidency of Thomas Jefferson, who was in office from 1801 to 1809. <coughs> the dissertation was well written. While it might not have been called a literary masterpiece in form or content, 
It is above the level of many of modern college students' production. So who taught him this stuff? Him and the Holy Spirit. Going over stuff and studying and studying and studying. Now, completely shocked to me, he became a deputy sheriff in 1809. Did anybody ever know that he was a deputy sheriff? In 1810, he was appointed a lieutenant in the militia of the state of Vermont, signed by the governor Jonas, that guy, July 21, 1810. Now, for people who don't know what a militia is, even though the government doesn't like them, they still have militias today. You saw one recently in Oregon and one in Nevada. They're still present. On November 7, 1812, Lieutenant Miller was made a captain of the militia. That's all he knew what he was doing. Well organized. In 1813, he was appointed a lieutenant in the U.S. Army. So he kept on advancing. And it was reported in a battle on the west bank of Lake Champion, Champlain, they was outnumbered on land and sea. September 11, 1814, he wrote, at the commencement of the battle, we looked upon our defeat as almost certain, yet we were victorious. You think the Holy Spirit was with him? He had other plans for him. Uh, one day in May 1816, I detected myself in the act of taking the name of God in vain. Yeah, he's like everybody else. We've always done. We've all have done that sometime in our life. A habit I had acquired in the service, and I was instantly convicted of its sinfulness. Why was he? Because his parents put in there that the Holy Spirit that you're not supposed to do these things. I tried to stop thinking, but my thoughts would not be controlled. Have we ever been like that, the craziness going on in our mind? I was, to I was truly wretched, but did not understand the cause. I murmured and complained, but knew not of whom. I felt that there was a wrong, but knew not how or where to find the right. I mourned, but without hope. Can you kind of put your foot, your, yourself in his shoes? Going through these things? I have, because when I started studying prophecy in 1982, I didn't know anybody that thought the things that I did. I thought I was all alone, all the time. Went to my parents, and they looked at me. These conversations with himself brought him to this. Yeah, he was talking to himself. And I used to tell people in the air, you talk to yourself, and if they say no, well, you're not telling the truth. Everybody talks to themselves. They just don't want to tell people. These conversations with himself uh, brought himself to this. At length, when brought almost to despair, God by his Holy Spirit opened my eyes. I saw Jesus as a friend and my only help and the word of God as the perfect rule of duty. So you started to see he was setting down these foundations that you cannot get away from these foundations. Like Christ says, be not deceived. I felt that to the believer of stuff as a savior without evidence would be visionary to the extreme. I saw that the Bible did bring to view just such a savior, savior as I needed. And I was perplexed to find how in an uninspired book, the Bible, should develop principles so perfectly adapted to the wants of a falling world. I was constrained to admit that the scriptures must be a revelation from God. They became a delight, and in Jesus I found a friend. See, he had some of those questions, as we will see with being a deist and some of these other problems, all working in the mind. <coughs> Soon after this, in the fall of 1860, I was conversing with a friend, respecting my hope of a glorious eternity through the merits and the intercessions of the Savior. And he asked me how I knew that there was a Savior. Has anybody ever asked you that? Did you answer him? 
I replied that he was revealed in the Bible. He then asked me how I knew the Bible was true and advanced my former diastole arguments which, on the inconsistencies and the mysticisms in which I had claimed it was shrouded. I replied that if the Bible was the word of God, everything contained therein might be understood and all its parts be made to harmonize. And I said to him that if he would give me time, I would harmonize all these apparent contradictions to my own satisfaction, or I would be a deist still. He made a promise to his friend, and he made a promise to himself. How many times have we made promises to ourselves that we have not kept? or our father. I was thus brought in 1818 at the close of my two year study of the scriptures to the solemn conclusion that in about 25 years from that time, all the affairs of our present state would be wound up. This would be about 1843. He waited 13 years before he publicly talked about this kept it private. When I was studying prophecy back in the 1980s, 1990s, I kept hearing this voice. Keith, you're going to speak in front of people sometime. Yeah, right. I had went through that same. Various difficulties and objections would arise in my mind. See, I'm talking about the mind, the things going on, figuring things out. From time to time, certain texts would occur to me which seemed to weigh against my conclusions, and I would not present a view to others while any difficulty appeared to mutilate against it. I therefore continued to study the Bible to see if I could sustain any of these objections. My objections was not merely to remove them, but I was to see if they was valid. That's genius. We all should do that. See both sides. See all sides. Think him through. <coughs> he wrote that when he was about his business, there was continually ringing in his ears the command, go and tell the world of their danger. I tried to excuse myself to the Lord for not going out and proclaiming it to the world. I told the Lord that I was not used to public speaking, that I had not the necessary qualifications to gain the attention of an audience, that I was very definite, and I had to look that up, shy because of lack of self-confidence, and feared to go before the world. So, Lim, you're not the only one. Moses, a lot of people, he went through the same thing. I don't qualify. I'm not worthy. The first proof we have as it, it respects Christ's second coming as to time is in Daniel 8, 14. On to 2,300 days until the sanctuary is cleansed. By days, we are to understand years. Sanctuary, we understand the church. Cleanse, we may reasonably suppose, means that complete redemption from sin, both soul and body. After the resurrection, when Christ comes the second time without sin unto salvation, it kept ringing in his ears, go and tell the world of their danger. Now, you notice when, whenever a Seventh-day Adventist quotes Daniel 8, 14, they always quote the answer to the question. They hardly ever quote the verse before it, which is the question. Being a nurse, I like the details. And I know there's some nurses. Go and tell the world of their danger. Are we going to have to do this again? Oh, yeah. He reasoned that if he did not follow this sense of duty, that if he remained silent, the blood of the lost would be on his garments. Now, who did you think put that on him? That was the Holy Spirit. Now, this year was in 1831. 
my distress, my distress became so great, I entered into a solemn covenant with God that if he would open the way, I would go and perform my duty to the world. What do you mean by opening the way? Seemed to come to me. Why, I said, if I should have an invitation to speak publicly in any place, I will go and tell them what I find in the Bible about the Lord's com coming. Instantly, all my burdens was gone, and I rejoiced that I should not probably be thus called upon. They're not going to call upon me. For I had never had such an invitation. My trails were not known, and I had but little expectation of being invited to any field of labor. You know what happens when you make an offer and a contract with God? He will keep his end. Finding all the signs of the ties and the present condition of the world to compare harmoniously with the prophetic descriptions of the last days, I was compelled to believe that the world had about reached its limits of the period allotted for its continuance. As I regarded the evidence, I could arrive at no other conclusion. Now, before I forgot to put page numbers in, then later afterwards I put page numbers in. So let's see what, what happens next. What he did not know was that even while he was making such apparently safe terms with the Lord, there was traveling down the, mid, the highway near the, from the nearby town of Dresden, a young man bearing an invitation to him to preach the following day, for this was a Saturday morning. Uh-oh. Miller was too astonished to even to reply. He walked out of the room angry with himself, he says, for having made this covenant I had. Can you see it? I rebelled at once against the Lord and determined not to go. Thank you. Through the house... Through the house and out the back door he went. Six-year-old Lucy Ann, his favorite child, followed him. She did not know the inner conflict, which she went back to her mother frightened, told her mother, something's the matter with Daddy. Yeah, your, your family, your, your kids will pick that up right away. That night after dinner, he left for Dresden. As soon as I commenced speaking, all my, there's that word again, defiance, shyness, and self, uh, poor yeah. feelings, yeah. pardon me? Defidence. That's a word that we don't use anymore, at least I don't, I'd never heard of it. And embarrassment were gone, and I felt impressed only with the greatness of the subject, which by the providence of God I was enabled to present. I love such an impression, he was in, it had left such an impression, he was invited to remain and lecture some more, and he found himself engaged in a revival. It was not as he had planned. Yeah, we're going to be going through this again. He wrote of a brother, Sawyer, who had adopted some of his views, but who had not improved so much in Bible knowledge as he might. Because, added, added Miller, he was afraid of being a Millerite. This term was introduced. Here is the first reference to the idea of converts as to follow, followers of a particular man. The word Millerite was soon to be heard over the whole land. And I know that there's people that's feast keepers today that don't want people to know about it because they're afraid. I ought to make some apology for my long, long neglect, but hate apologies, for we never tell the whole truth. This, uh, very direct and very frank, was typical of William Miller. In other words, when he apologized, he's not really apologizing. And that's being truthful with himself. A lot of people aren't truthful with themselves, me included. Now, if you, if you look at this here, this is a picture of one of his meetings. And if you see this here, this is a chart that he had up there. We will show it later. It 
1833, Low Hampton, still without a Baptist preacher, preacher, and Miller had been called to occupy the pulpit. Here is how he described himself. We have no preacher as yet except an old man with his concordance. Yeah, he was known as having the Bible in his concordance. He didn't have the e-sword and all the stuff that we have today. And that's what's truly amazing of what these guys came up with. And he was so shunned shunned with his cold, dull, and lifeless performance that has strong doubts whether he will attempt again. But hush, not a word of what I tell you. Send us a a minister if you can. In other words, he says, I'm not worthy to be, you know, to do this here. Miller told his Baptist preacher friend, Hendricks, of eight Baptist ministers who are now preaching his views. He gave the names of each and added, many others believe, but dare not preach it. Boy, I've heard that. On this point, he was very specific, for he named the ten preachers. Yeah, he was a name, he was a person that named them. Now, he had some help. Here's some of the people, Joshua Himes, uh, Josiah Litch, William Miller, Charles Fitch and Joseph Bates. These are some of the the leaders that was presenting these things at the time. In the later years of the Millerite movement, and most particularly Miller, came under heavy fire from every kind of critic. Much of the criticism impugnated the personal motives of Miller and his close associates. And some of that was they was getting money for pamphlets and stuff, and they was said that they was using it for their own use and and stuff like that. But if you come out and start uh, talking about these things, you're going to get critics. And we haven't even seen the, the real ones yet. What manner of this man was this William Miller who could persuade preachers of various denominations to accept his teachings? Preachers are not in the habit of changing their religious views. So it's like John. John puts the seed in there, and the Holy Spirit finishes it. That's what happened with these other preachers. On more than one occasion, Miller had wished that he might begin to paper, but he had never been able to find a man who was willing to run the risk of his reputation of the particular expense in such a publication. Yeah, because people didn't want to be associated with him. He wanted an organ which he might present the truth concerning these false charges. Lots of them. Hardly had he described to Himes the need of a publication for the movement when he when this born promoter proceeded without a subscriber or any promise of assistance to issue the first number of a publication called The Signs of the Time. This paper was started in early in 1840. So when The Signs of the Times started, it wasn't really Signs of the Times. It was to answer critics. The conference, and I put general in there, the general conference was held in Chardon Street Chapel in Boston, of which Joshua V. Hines was the pastor. Among the presiding officers and committee members of this conference were found the names of such men as Henry Dana Ward, Henry Jones, Hines, Litch, Bates. During the next two years, many sessions of the general conference were held in different cities. In our modern language, we would probably describe it as an inner church movement. Those who made the call for the first session of the general conference were very specific, as we noted in announcing that they had no intention to set up a new sect. The subject is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So they was having these general conferences. This is before there was a Seventh-day Adventist church. I will just state for your edification that for one year up to the 1st of October, 1840, I traveled 46, 60 miles, preached 627 lectures. Each lecture would average as much as an hour and a half long. 
Now I want to tell you, one year, 600, that's two, he was averaging two and three lectures a day. He did not have a car. He had a horse and a carriage. Where are us lazy people today compared to what these men did? That's incredible. That's in the bad weather and everything. We need more men like that. William Mare was disturbing Satan's kingdom, and the archenemy sought not only to counteract the effects of the message, but to destroy the messenger himself. This is from Ellen White. As Father Miller made a practical application of Scripture truth to the hearers of his, to the ears of his hearers, the rage of professed Christians was kindled against him, even as the anger of the Jews was excited against Christ and his apostles. Church members stirred up a baser classes, and upon several occasions, enemies plotted to take his life as he should leave the place of the meeting. But Holy angels were in the throng. And one of these, in the form of a man, took the arm of his servant of the Lord and led him to safely from the angry mob. And that's where it's from. Did you know that about Ellen White? I mean, about William Miller? God said, let them build a sanctuary that I may dwell among him. John has a sanctuary here. He's here with all of his angels tonight. You better believe it. And this will happen again. Now, this is, I'm not sure if this is the same picture, but this is a picture like that uh, William Miller had. And yeah, he carried it around in his carriage wherever he went. One man wrote, this certifies and went on to declare that he had heard Miller state in a certain church in the month of May, 1839, that there would not be any more rain on the earth or any marriages after a certain date. Miller responded, I never predicted there would be no rain on earth at any time or place since I have believed, since I have believed my Bible. For I do solemnly and firmly believe that when Christ comes, he will rain hail, fire and brimstone on all liars and will sweep away the refuges and the lies. Now, what do you call that today? Yeah, but that's hate speech. Yeah, we don't have this speech today. The principal object of the meeting is to awake sinners and purify Christians by giving the midnight cry to hold up the immediate coming of the Christ to judge the world. And that was their message. On January 1, 1843, Miller published a synopsis of his belief. And in a closing article, number 14, set forth his view on the time. I believe the time can be known by all who desire to understand and be ready for its coming. And I am fully convinced that sometime between March 21, 1843 and March 21, 1844, according to the Jewish mode of computation of time, Christ will come and bring his, all his saints with him and that when he will reward every man according to his work will be. Now you see, that's the date that, Ellen, that uh, William Miller said Christ was coming. March 21, 1843 to March 21, 1844. That is not talked about in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Miller set no date or day within this period, nor did anybody with him. So when did October 22, 1844 come, come around? Oh, also to help in to turn their people to, to Christ, suddenly in the cold twilight of late February, there appeared a bizone across the southern sky, a flaming comet. Nature seemed to be conspiring with the Millerites to turn men's eyes towards the sky. I thought that was interesting. 
On May 2, six weeks after the fatal March 21, 1844, Miller felt that the time had come to go make a frank statement that there was an error in his preaching. Were I to live my life over again with the same evidence that I had then had, to be honest with God and man, I should have to do as I have done. If he had to do it all over knowing the, the, the failure, he would have done it again. Yet I still believe that the day of the Lord is near, even at the door, and I will exhort to you, my brethren, to be watchful and not let that day come upon you unawares. And take that to heart. Even before this uncertainty began to trouble, began to trouble the Millerites, a new date was already being suggested. Samuel S. Snow, in the midnight cry as early as February 1844, put forth the view that the great time prophecy of 2300 prophetic days, Daniel 8, 13, and 14, which is at the heart of all Millerite reckoning, would not end until the autumn of 1844. To make more exact the calculations, Snow's letter was prefaced with an editorial note which expressed serious doubt as to the correctness of his reasoning. Don't they always do that? Here's this, but don't believe it. In fact, he, Snow, had not been studying it long, but before he finally set October 22, 1844, as the date of the termination of the prophetic period. You know, and there's a lot of people that don't know who uh, this uh, Samuel Snow is. So when did it finally get excited with this new date? On the 12th of August, there's an exact date, that's of 1844, just before October 22. On, on the 12th of August, a five-day camp meeting opened in Exeter, New Hampshire, only a few miles away from East Kingston, where the first Adventist camp meeting in the United States had been held just two years earlier. It was this extra meeting, according to the United Testimony of all the Millerite writers, that this new belief concerning the specific date, October 22, finally took hold of the Adventists in, the, in New England, changing their in, indefinite time, very real conviction of the nearness of the Lord's coming. The lectures among the Adventists were the last to embrace. Oh, the lectures, that's the people doing, you know, the people that's running the Millerite movement. The lectures among the Adventists were the last to embrace the views of the time. And the more prominent ones came into it last of all. It seemed not to be the work of man, but to be brought about in spite of man. Now, let's see if that. There was, in, in that meeting, I didn't put that in there, but there was, uh, there, it was, uh, wasn't going well. And a middle-aged woman stood up in the middle and talked about snow. And that's when the people got excited. It wasn't the people doing it. It was the people there from a middle-aged woman. It didn't name who she was. Now, what went on down there? Was it all peace and everything? This is an example. It, there was a whole bunch of stuff in this uh, big article that talked about this, but this is an example. A New Hampshire paper discussed the Millerites and riots in Philadelphia, stating that the sheriff of the city and county of Philadelphia, with his officers, had gone to the different places of meetings of the Millerite and caused them to desist from any further lectures as great crowds of persons were attracted by their proceedings and many were disposed to riots. They threw rocks and stuff, all kinds of stuff that happened to the buildings. It wasn't a pretty picture. But we don't see that when we look back to what happened in the 1840s. From mod scenes and mass meetings in great cities, we turn our eyes now to the quiet spot called Lowhampton. Miller had completed his summer trip west 
and was once more at home resting from the arduous labors that had told so heavily on his meager physical resources. He was acquainted with the evidence and arguments on which a rapidly increasing number of believers were relying on for their hope that Christ would come on October 22. But he had not accepted this view. He was loath to do so. And um, Dean, this is what you was talked about. He always had held that no man could know the day or the hour of the Lord's coming. He had never felt free to be more specific than to foretell it in terms of the... See, he did say a year, but nobody knew the day or the hour. And he never did, he did, never did approve or, or accept it. Now, this is from, from Mrs. White. Jesus and all the heavenly hosts looked with sympathy and love upon those who had with sweet expectation longed to see him whom their souls loved. Angels was hovering around them. That's the group, you know, 18, on October 22. Was hovering around them to sustain them in the hour of their trial. Those who had neglected to receive the heavenly message were left in darkness. Isn't that sad? And God's anger was kindled against them because they would not receive the light which he had sent them from heaven. Who sent that light? God sent it. Those faithful, disappointed ones who could not understand why their Lord did not come were not left in darkness. Again, they were led to their Bibles to search for prophetic periods. And you kind of know the rest of the history. And here's a text that we started out with. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Throw it, tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, and it will not tarry. Now, it's my belief that we're going to go through the same thing again. Okay, can we bow our heads for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for this the beginning of this new Sabbath that we have. Guide and help us so that we go to leave tonight that we can keep it properly. Guide and also the people that the results of all of these uh, calamities that has been happening this last month on this planet. Be with the, the victims that are hurting especially in some of those people that have completely lost their homes, don't have any place to stay. Also, the people that are very lonely, like you was, Jesus. You said you thought your father had forsaken you. These people think that everybody has forsaken them. Send your Holy Spirit to be with them and give them comfort. In your name, amen.